Fantasy Animation is a completely free online educational resource dedicated to examining the relationship between fantasy storytelling and the medium of animation. It is staffed by a volunteer army of academics and animators who give up their time to run the website so that our audience can be kept informed not just about the latest goings on in the world of all things that are drawn, imagined and sculpted, but to help inform them about the historical, political, ethical and aesthetic ramifications of what it means to make an animated fantasy. Check out our weekly blog posts containing insights on everything from the sexual identity of Spongebob Squarepants to how to make an animation on a pair of knickers. You can also access our archive of podcasts featuring Oscar-winning VFX supervisors, historians, classicists, animators and folklorists discussing their favourite examples of fantasy animation. To find out more, visit us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and Reddit at FanAnimResearch, F-A-N-A-N-I-M Research, or visit fantasy-animation.org. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi listeners and welcome to the latest episode of the Fantasy Animation Podcast with me Chris Holiday And me Alex Sargent. So for this episode we're going international and we're looking at a country and a, and a set of films that we perhaps haven't looked at before on the podcast. Um, taking a, a trip to China and looking at some kind of recent examples uh, of animated films or animated fantasy films within the Chinese context and in particular um, the Shanghai Film Studio to try and interrogate perhaps some of the, the, the codes and conventions uh, and also the, the kind of biting satire as it turns out uh, of a cross section of, of examples that are chosen by our very special guest who I will introduce shortly but from, from my perspective I think there is lots to say around, around kind of satire and the relationship between tradition and modernity uh, and one of the things that struck me about these kind these kind of top five examples that we're going to look at uh, is their, I guess, divergent style and, and ways in which we can kind of place them on a on a potential continuum of, of realist aesthetics versus more kind of modernist um, abstraction. So that's that's me, um, Alex, fantasy, China, monks. Talk to me. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, uh, this is all this is all very new to both yourself and me. Yeah, um, so yeah. uh, we're going to be led by our guest in just a second. Um, it's nice to do these kind of episodes. We did another one um, a while back on 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 uh, sub-Saharan African animation, and it's nice to sort of jump into these different contests. And usually, the question I have as a fantasy theorist is the same: in that, you know, in a different culture ideas of fantasy and ideas of reality are all very different that you know we don't have the same traditions of what a fantastical thing is and what a realistic thing is and and you know just from an outsider's perspective a country like china has given uh fantasy the fantasy genre so many interesting characters and iconographies and and ideas uh and we probably as in terms of the western tradition have imposed a lot of values onto this uh culture and this society so it'd be nice to see what fantasies are conjured up from within so to speak yes and definitely i think as you said we're going to be led by our very special guest who for this episode uh, is dr juan wan chen who teaches animation history and theory at ulster university and her research focuses primarily on contemporary Chinese animation with a particular interest in the influence of modernism which I think will really be borne out in some of the examples we, we look at and postmodernism on Chinese animation after the 1980s. Um, now her research encompasses amongst many things animation theory, animation narratives uh, and kind of yeah, that modernity versus postmodernism in cinema uh, and I've been thrilled to work with Huan Huan um, on a, a recent book on, on Snow White where she contributed a, a chapter um, in a section that was really about the, the diverse sort of international art afterlives and legacies of the um, both the fairy tale and, and the Disney 1937 feature. So um, really nice to, to sort of put a face to the name. Um, so thank you, Juan Ran, for joining us on the uh, Fantasy Animation podcast. Thank you so much, boss, for inviting me. 
Well, we're really thrilled to, to have you on, particularly because, as Alex said, and this is an area that we are um, not familiar with, though actually I think a lot of the examples, when I was watching them, um, I felt really at home with some of the things that they were kind of trying to do, particularly in the, in the aesthetic style. Um, we gave you a kind of, Alex gave you an impossible question before we even began the podcast, which was trying to come up with what, what a cross-section of Chinese animation might look like, if there even is such a thing, given the, the sort of amorphousness of what, what Chinese-ness might actually mean. Um, and you came back with a few few kind of examples, but before we go through a rundown of, of their different form and style and, and, and narrative and, and yes, yeah, satirical bite, if you like, I just wondered if you could kind of give, and I do mean a very brief history of Chinese animation, but also maybe folding in some of your research, because I know that you work primarily in, in contemporary stuff, and so um, it really good to get a sense of, of your approach to Chinese animation before we go into the, the sort of top five um, produced by the, the Shanghai uh, Film Studio and also who the Shanghai Film Studio are. Uh, yes, of course. Um, uh, firstly, I probably um, just to start with a very brief history of Chinese animation, just in yeah. case you're very familiar with that. So um, actually the first Chinese animation was made in the 1920s during the Republic of China period um, by um, by the one brothers who were inspired yeah. by the success of uh, Western animated film, especially Disney animation film. So um, you can see that's the early stage and Chinese animation will deeply influenced by the an, uh, American animation techniques and aesthetics. Um, but later, um, Chinese in, in Ch animation in China become a little bit more established as an art form. And this kind of Western influence disappeared very soon. So actually after 1949, um, the People's Republic of China was established. Um, yeah. But the Communist Party, there was a very short period during which become, uh, because of the political system, um, you know, the only material that Chinese animators could reach was from the Soviet, uh, Soviet unit and the Eastern European socialist countries. So um, there was a very short period of Chinese animation present some Soviet features. Um, but the high, I want to highlight it as between the 1950s and the 1980s, a large number of outstanding animated fil uh, films produced by the Shanghai Animation Studio, Animation Film Studio, and uh, uh, gained very high international reputation because of their very unique Chinese style and this kind of uh, oriental aesthetics. So those three decades of Shanghai Animation Film Studio from the 1950s to the 1980s are generally considered as the most successful period of Chinese animation. So that's why we are going to look into at this period, the animation works produced in this period and uh, uh, Shanghai Animation Film Studio. So is it then this, this history that you're sort of plotting? Um, it seems like it's that Disney is an inevitable reference point. You mentioned the Wan brothers, uh, and it seems like the, the Shanghai Animation Film Studio has these sorts of beginnings, golden ages, and things like this. So, so is, that, is that right, that, that Disney was this sort of model that, that pioneers and animated film studios sought to kind of replicate? Yes, probably I'd see in the very early 1920s. Yes, it is. But after New China established because of yeah. the political system and uh, China, the country actually was quite isolated. So um, instead of, um, you know, uh, imitating a Disney style, they start to explore their own national style to make animation films. So right. I would see Disney's um, uh, influence as, a, as, as just the very beginning for the very right, beginning right. animation history. And um, when we say China, obviously that's such a huge term with so many different cultures and, and uh, languages and everything else embodied within it. And it seems like what we're actually focusing on here with, with your choice of films is a particular um, uh, both region but also studio output of China, the, the Shanghai Film Studio. So could you just give listeners a sense of what, how important that is to the story of, of Chinese animation and this golden age that you're um you're referring to. to. 
Yeah, probably I, I, I talked a little bit about Shanghai Animation Film Studio, the history mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, the, China, uh, the, the People's Republic of China is established in 1949 um, under the leadership of Mao, the, uh, the Communist Party controls most of the mainland China. And, uh, um, you know, the People's Republic of China was established in the same year. And there was a small animation department that was founded. Um, in the Northeast Film Studio, handed by Te Wei. And later, this department was moved to Shanghai and was included in the Shanghai Film Studio uh, for better uh, location and you know, more professional and technical resources. So um, by 1957, the number of artists in this department had reached almost 200, quite, quite a big group. Mm. And uh, um, and around like twenty animation films had been produced at the beginning. Um, then, in nineteen fifty seven, the animation department uh, upgraded to a studio and independent from uh, Shanghai Film Studio, and known as the Shanghai Animation Film Studio. Um, it is very important um, to Chinese animation because it actually was the first Chinese animation, chi uh, its first Chinese institution, professional and specialized in animation making. And it was also the only uh, animation studio in China for the following 30 years till the late 1980s. So um, it actually is a fully state owned, state financed, and state controlled studio. Um, so uh, I would say um, the studio on the one hand is a sort of fantasy land for uh, Chinese artists because you know the government fully covered their living um, expense and, and salaries. Um, but on the other hand, it's kind of influenced by the state political circumstance. So um, that is how the, the, the studio is established. Um, so uh, I would say from the 1950s to 18, 1980s is really important period for Chinese animation. And Shanghai, studio, Shanghai Animation Film Studio was the only studio actually produced all the animations, um, all the Chinese animations. Well, we be we better get going then with these with these films because uh, a lot to cover and a lot to say and uh, yeah. And I should say that um, if you want to watch any of the uh, shorts that we are discussing here, we're going to have them all linked and ready. I say we. Chris is going to do all the hard work um, and, and have them linked and embedded in in our website synopsis. So you can find that in our podcast section. Just find the episode in question, and um, you'll find them all there, ready to watch on YouTube and various other devices. They're also freely available if you just Google them. So just Google the, the title of these movies, and you and you'll find them but um yeah that's how you can watch along at home we're going to sort of roughly do this chronologically but we'll jump around a little bit but we're going to start at least with the earliest example um you've given us one which i'm going to let you introduce for the listeners but i'll give you the, the title um it's from 1954 it's a shanghai animation studio film and uh, the conceited general so why don't you tell listeners um uh, about the conceited general uh, yes, um, it's, um, this film was directed by um, Te Wei, who, is, who was the hand of the studio, and Li Kuro, and the film was released in, actually in 1956, around 23 minutes long. Um, the story is about a uh, Victoria uh, general who returns home in Trump and rewarded by the king and overpriced by the people around him. Um, the general becomes a very um, the, uh, con uh, uh, like a conceited and believe himself um, invisible. So he no longer practice and spend all the time eating, drinking and playing. So um, one day when the uh, enemy returns, the general is easily defeated and captured and leaves his country occupied by the enemy. So that's uh, the story about, uh, about this film. And yeah. um, actually, I also want to mention that, there, that the key words I want to give this film actually is traditional Chinese opera. So, um, uh, yeah, because um, that is a very early film. Um, yeah. And it, it was the first animated film made by Shanghai Animation Film Studio that widely employs and Chinese traditional operatic elements. Right, right. Because uh, Chinese traditional tra traditional Chinese opera is very important to Chinese Chinese animation. So basically, they, they borrowed usually any Chinese animation. They borrowed a lot of um, operatic elements 
into their animation making. And this film was the first one. Uh, so that's why I choose this one. So um, so you probably need to know a little bit about Chinese opera. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Chinese opera basically, uh, it compiles singing, dancing, music, um, fine arts, dialogues, Kung Fu and so on in one. So it's kind of emphasize um, exaggeration and stylization in its visual aspect and also the rhythm and uh, percussion music in its audience aspect. Um, <clears throat> so um, you might find the music uh, and the character design, as you said, is quite distinctive. Um, so um, this film actually heavily borrows the painted face, also called like a, a facial mask that is right. typically seen in Chinese opera. So um, it's also highly stylized movement and uh, percussion music uh, from the traditional Chinese opera, which makes it very different from probably the Western animation. So uh, it's kind of the first step of Chinese animation in the progress of nationalization. Um, right. Nationalization. So um, that's, that's the reason I pick up this one. Yeah, I, I must admit, I, I kept quiet there because I cheated because after I watched it, I did Google and um and read a little bit about it being inspired by what, what I read as this be Beijing opera. I don't know if there's a distinction between Chinese opera and Beijing opera. Um, do do tell us if there is. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I, 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 the thing I got on my notes that I was then retrospectively smug to notice when I read these characteristics of, of the this operatic system was I found the music very, very kind of, um I mean, I wrote overpowering, but that sounds like a negative. I'm not, it's certainly this is a this is a story told through music rather than with music it's you know there's very little dialogue um there's some but not much and, and the music that is used is kind of dominates the, the soundscape and then the other thing i noticed was that characters seem to be much more sort of ornately designed at the level of body and movement and the way they moved seemed to be a very important part of their characterization rather than say any elaborate kind of facial design not to say that they don't have faces but like if i was comparing this to say a western cartoon quite a lot of the information you get about a character in a western cartoon is from the face but here actually a lot of the the characterization is found through movement and i i wrote both of those things down then googled what beijing opera was and was smug to find that there were parallels between those two things so i don't know is that with that with that rec with that chime with how you um what are these differences that we're supposed yeah, to be picking I mean up on I mean, you really mentioned something, uh, a few things, a few points very important to this film. First is, uh, you know, the character design in terms of the faces. So uh, there is a painted faces. Actually, the painted faces are very widely utilized in this animation. So um, because in traditional Chinese opera or Peking opera, um, you know, different painted faces often suggest different personality of the character, you know, by applying different patterns um, or colors. For instance, usually a red face uh, refers to a lawyer or passionate character. And the black face is often applied on sometimes it's ugly, but honest character. And the white face usually indicates a uh, villain. So in this film, uh, you can see the elements of the facial mask are highly recognizable. And uh, um, the, the character is actually is based on the um, you know, the, the character design of the general, you, you mentioned the general, yeah. actually is based on the jing in Chinese opera. The jing is a role type in Chinese opera for this kind of rough and mighty male character. So the painted face with white background and the um, red, black and blue colors in a pet uh, shape suggests, you know, his uh, a forceful and the reckless um, characteristic, you know, they usually have a very strong voice and very exaggerated um, gestures. And uh, I don't know if you notice, there's another character, um, the generous advisor. You know that. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Like actually, that's it based on Chou Rou in Chinese opera. So it this this role works like um, you know clown role to provide some uh, comedical effects and like the uh, slap sticks in the film. Um, mm. So he got this, uh, um, you know, um, the, you know, the, 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 the wiser, the, his painted face of Cho is a kind of filtered by a small uh, patch of white chalk around the nose. Mm. 
I, I don't know if you notice that there's mm. a white pattern on his nose, uh, which you can also find the, um, this, this, this guy's face. So um, also because of white in Chinese opera um, usually indicates a villain. So it relates right. the, the role of the advisor. And also Alex, you mentioned this tale, this movement is very important. Um, it's very stylized. Um, they use a lot of um, stylized movement and the poses. Uh, from traditional Chinese opera. So for the local audience, uh, they don't need uh, any explanation. You know, a stylized op uh, operatical movement or pose uh, usually, um, you know, have their meaning to show the, uh, let's say the intention of the character or the, to show the situation of the character. For example, in Chinese opera, there's uh, like a, the mountain shoulder um, posts usually indicate uh, there is a fight or, you know, there is a side work movement always suggest the character is struggling in a difficult situation or a very quick backflip um, movement usually means a dangerous escape. So, um, so you might find that it's quite different from uh, Japanese uh, limited animation that often use very fast editing to create this tension mm. and actions or, you know, the Disney animation that they uh, exaggerate the real physical movements, you know, by applying, let's say, um, scratch and stretch principle to achieve yep. comical effects. So the mm. movement and actions in this film are highly stylized and are very um, subjective. If you are a local audience, you know what is, what is going on and uh, very perform uh, performative. So based on what I was going to ask a question about the relationship between the local and the global, and you mentioned local in terms of audiences, um, because I, you know, it, I think it's, yeah, it, there's a challenge when, when confronted with, with um, animation, perhaps that you are not initially familiar with. And I was thinking around, yeah, writing on many moons ago when I taught a class on Chinese um, cinemas, history of Chinese cinemas, um, thinking about Ray Chow writing on Chinese, and this is a theoretical problem, and the sort of the, the essentialism that might support a Western perspective on Chinese animation that leans almost entirely on it, picking out the historical and cultural characteristics that are specific to China. Um, and I know that there's been a, a, a sort of a number of, of scholars writing from both a Chinese perspective, um, Wan Haizu, Xiaopang Chen, and Daisy Yandu, uh, and Sean McDonald as well has recently written a book on the history of Chinese animation aesthetics. And so I was just wondering, uh, is a film like The Conceited General, is this, because I noticed some of the examples have dialogue and some don't, and this does have dialogue um, that you suggested to us. I just wondered, in terms of this film, is this primarily, given that there's a degree of hybridity from the Chineseness of it, and its Disney influences, so the tradition and then the, I guess, the modernity of, 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 of Disney in, in the, the US Hollywood context. Are these, is this, this a film that is aimed at local audiences with a bit of, um, uh, you know, Disney style embroiled in, in, in it? Or is it aimed for a global audience bringing Chinese-ness out to the world? I'm just trying to get my head around the sort of scholarly problem of Chineseness as it's been written about within within academia and, and how that might map onto a film in terms of that local and global um, potential audience is this for is this appealing to a local audience or is this is this sort of advertising in in the broadest sense Chineseness to to the rest of the world? No, uh, the, uh, I think it's actually aimed at the local audience. That's right, why right. Use, that's why they use this very traditional operatic elements right. because local. The national audience, um, you know, they, give, they can win the national audience with a very familiar and recognizable look because uh, Peking Opera have a long history and animation is quite new. So yes, uh, yes. In, in this um, operatic, uh, sorry, the opera, operatic elements, so the audience find that very familiar with it. But as right. it has, um, uh, animation, Chinese animation short short animation actually exhibited internationally in the film festivals. So, so I think this one also wins the international audience with a very fresh Chinese look because, you know, it's a very Chinese and yeah. uh, probably never see that before. So it's also quite successful internationally because it's Chinese look, obviously. 
we we've got plenty more films to get to. I'd love to to move away from from the from the general himself because it's a, it's a wonderful movie and I and I really enjoyed it. But we'll move on to our next one, which we're jumping nearly 15, 16 years now. So um, the next film uh, that you've selected for us from Wan Wan is uh, A Deer of Nine Colors. Uh, which I believe is based on a, um, a traditional folk tale. So I'm sold, I'm in, um, from 1981. So if you could tell listeners the story of this film, perhaps both on the screen, but also wh- why have we got to wait 16 years from, from this film to the last one? What's happening now? Because most of the examples you're about to give us are from the 80s. So perhaps fill in what happens between um, The Conceited General and um, a movie like this one. Um, yes, um, actually, um, probably have to uh, jump back to a little bit about the history of Chinese uh, of Shanghai Animation Film Studio, um, mm-hmm. because there were uh, two golden era of Chinese anim- uh, of uh, of Shanghai Animation Studio. Um, the first period actually was um, from the nineteen fifty seven to nineteen sixty five. It was considered as the first golden era of Chinese animation. Um, the film made by Shanghai Animation Film Studio. And because the studio experienced a remarkable development and it established a very distinctive Chinese tale of animation by bringing traditional Chinese literature and art into their animation making. So the general one is a very good example to show how they use this traditional Chinese uh, art to make animation. And then there was actually from the 1966 to 1976, there was a 10 year of Chinese uh, Cultural Revolution. So um, which Chinese animation suffered a really, really bad blow because of the po- political circumstance. So many animators in the studio were prevented from working and sent to the countryside uh, for the re-education. So during that 10 years, there was actually not many uh, films made by the studio. That's why there is like a 10 year gap. There's no really good animation produced. And then after the country revolution, so from the 1970s to the middle 1980s, uh, is usually considered as the second golden era of Chinese animation. Um, so during this period, you know, um, the Shanghai Animation Film Studio kind of returned to its old way to create this kind of national and traditional style of animation and reach another, reached another, another peak of its animation production. Um, so that's why there is a big jump from the 1950s to 1980s. Great. Okay, cool. Okay, and so now we're in the 1980s. What's, um, what's this film, uh, A Deer of, of Nine Colors, offering to kind of the history of, 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 of this Shanghai studio? Yeah, A Deer of Nine Colors um, was made in 1981, directed by um, Chen Jiajun and the Dai Tianang. It's around 25 minutes long. Mm-hmm. Um, and the original story is based on a Buddhist tale, which was discovered as a um, mural painting in Mogok, in Mogok caves in Dunhuang in China. So the story actually is about a magical deer with night colors um, uh, who saves a drawn man, but um, um, it's betray- it was betrayed by him later. So the man was rescued basically by this deer and promised that he's not going to tell others about his whereabouts. But when he knows that the king is hunting down the deer to make clothes out of his skin, and then he leads the hunters to the deer um, just for the rewards. So he pretended to be um, drowning again, try to bring the deer to the lake, but this time, all the hunters' uh, uh, arrows turned into a um, desk, and uh, the man was drawn. So that's a, that's the story. Mm-hmm. It's a good story. I like it. It's uh, it's it's got traces of real kind of you know proper uh, thematic folkloric elements. I'm I'm not surprised it's based on an on a, on a, on a Buddhist um, a folk tale um, from from the Jataka, I believe. If if I have if Google doesn't fail me so yeah I, th- I thought it was a really kind of clean um epic but simple story just like good sto- folk stories should be so yeah absolutely i i thought it was really you know the, the way in which it enchants nature which i feel like comes up a lot in mm. in, in animation the enchantment of, of nature and the way in which the, the deer I've, i i mean i have put bambi meets lassie and i think that's probably an accurate representation of the thematic um clout of the of the of the short i really liked the kind of religious image 
imagery. So the the uh, the, the design of the per, per, um, the design of the potion merchant, essentially the the villain of the or the one of the two villains really of the piece. Um, I really like the design of his character, and when he is initially drowning, and the and the deer chooses to save him, sort of parts the sea, and and that allows for his his rescue. Uh, and then I I sort of I liked the shift then to the spoiled queen who wants that sort of I think the um, the subtitles describe it as an, an auspicious and mysterious deer essentially the 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 wants wants the deer for herself to to use the the skin I think or the the, the covering or something yeah the skin um, and then I really liked some of the and this is actually true of the conceited general as well because there's a couple of point of view shots I think in the in the conceited general that that use that use kind of visual effects to sh- towards the end that show his disorientation. So almost like the layering of images. And you get it in this film where you have a, an interesting optical effect that shows sort of multiple horses that ride in search of the deer. And you have these kind of cascading feet that overlay each other, which I really liked. Um, but I was really interested in this portrayal of c- conceited characters and, and the idea of kind of, I don't know, the, the villains are quite clearly signposted in a way that, that they don't want to take over the world or they don't want to do these kind of megalomania. It, it's more about kind of character and their flaws as 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 characters and, and as people. And I felt that was a really interesting way of thinking about villainy and animation. It feels a very traditional way of, of I don't know, presenting a character who's, who's um, a villain through their, I don't know, uh, ability to be bought. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, um, actually, the, the one thing I want to highlight for this film is, um, you know, um, it actually um, used a lot of traditional mural painting. And uh, um, the film is, uh, this film, the, the reason I choose this film, as you said, the character design, the reason I choose the film because this film is a very notable example of how Chinese animation fully, uh, let's see, um, utilized or um, appropriate traditional painting. So um, if you ever see the mural painting, a deal of night colors in the Dunhuang Mogao caves, you will find that nearly all the characters and the landscape, landscape in this film are exactly the same. So would that would this character have been familiar again with that kind of local global hat on? I'm just thinking, with given that there is a long standing tradition of this character in in folklore, is this a really important moment where there's an adaptation or a new version of a particularly familiar tale? And would that have been familiar to audiences that this is this is a, a, an animated adaptation or an animated retelling or an animated version of of that particular folktale? And also how useful at the animated medium is, which is still, as you say, relatively new, how important the animated medium is to articulate the fantasy? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Actually, um, um, I think that the local people are actually quite familiar with the story. Um, yeah. It's a famous story, but not many, I would say not many, I would say not many people really see um, that the, um, um, the um that's the painting uh, the i mean the mural painting in the right, uh, right. in the Kiel. so um probably i could say that it's a new version retail the story um but the the point i want to make is actually they use or they populate exact same uh, the character design and the landscape mm-hmm. from the original mural painting you know if you notice that the brick red ground, the white deer with colorful sports, yes. and, uh, F-ship, the female dancer, and the villain, the character of the villain, yes. uh, and uh, as well as the sterilized the mountain of the landscape. You know, this distinctive patterns of the uh, Dunhuang uh, mural, uh, mural painting are directly, actually are directly appropriate in this film. I think that's the reason that this film is quite uh, successful because I think I would say because of the painterless tale, um, and uh, right. um, in other words, the painterless tale is actually really important to mm. Chinese animation. So basically, they just uh, I would say the 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 frame could like code it or recycled the original images from the famous Chinese painting, and actually, it is a very easy way to achieve a, a success because. Um, 
um, especially in this visual aspect, because it take advantage of this remarkable work uh, in the history. So um, that's my point to this film. So um, that might, but, but come, uh, the question come to me is, it might make uh, this traditional or classical Chinese animation different, a little bit different from McLaurin's definition. He said animation is not the art of drawing that means, yeah. but the art of movement that are drawn. So it might come to a question, actually I'm quite interesting, which is more important to animate the film, you know, as a movement or as a painterly style? Because my argument you could see the success of the success of this film mainly based on the based on its painterly style mm-hmm. and uh, they directly they actually directly appropriate or code or recycle the characters from the original painting. Mm-hmm. So um so it's it's quite interesting to see probably to Chinese animation this kind of painterly style is more important and lead to its success rather than um as McLaurin said um, animation should be the movement that are drawn rather than, you know, the art of drawing that move. Mm. It's This is all music to my ears, uh, Huan Huan, because I often have a sort of an argument on the podcast about... Well, how anything. we see anything. how we see well about how we see animation um because yeah or anything that i can be bothered with that week but yeah um in this particular context um uh how we see animation and whether animation's history starts when you know we th- with the mechanical uh scientific inventions necessary to create a frame by frame illusion where most animation histories do start or whether we can see it as part of a wider cultural um, desire to sort of materialise the imaginative impulse, which plays into my hands, because that means really it's just an offshoot of fantasy, uh, and that means I win this perpetual argument me and Chris are having. Um, but but it, but I certainly took from what you're saying and, and from watching um, A Deer of Nine Colours that there is certainly an attempt to link the animation process to a much wider cultural legacy of painting and drawing mm. and sculpting and, and all these things, which I think we could count as part of the history of animation, just like I think puppetry could perhaps be considered within that story and, and all other kinds of craft painterly registers, which in one hand or another are are, are creating, like giving life to and visualising our fantasy stories. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely up for that arc. Um, uh, so we'll move on to number th- uh, to number three. Um, so this is we're jumping um, ahead now to 1988. So I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is the most recent entry of our list. So we'll go back and look at some others in just a second. But there's a reason you want to talk about this one um, next. Um, I believe maybe because of the artist, but but you correct me, Huan um, Huan. But the, the the film is called uh, Feeling from Mountain to Wa- uh, Mountain and Water, I should say. Um, and you can tell me more about uh, what this film is. Yeah, this film, um, probably I should uh, talk a little bit about uh, Te Wei, the director, yeah, before please we, yeah. we look into the film. Um, so Te Wei was actually born in 1915 in Shanghai, and he joined the studio in 1957 and worked in as working as the hand of the studio. And he started working on ink wash animation because it's, a, it's his third ink and wash animation. So he started working on ink and wash animation in 1960, and the director director his first ink wash animation called Where is Mama, uh, released in 1961. It was a very simple story about um, a group of um, teddy bears looking for their mommy. Um, so till we brought these techniques of um, traditional Chinese ink wash, anim- wash painting into animation making. So it makes the film full of um, oriental charm and a very distinctive from Western animation. So um, Where's the Mama received actually a lot of international and national rewards. And the Toei way was called the father of the ink wash animation. And in, if I remember correctly, I think it's in 1955, um, ASIFA, the International Animated Film Association gave Toei a lifetime accomplishment award because of his um, a contribution to the ink wash animation. So um, he uh, later on he, he his second ink and ink wash animation is was called a uh, 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 um, um, called boys fluid, 
was made、oh, yeah. in nineteen sixty three. Nineteen sixty three, um, it was about a charming relationship between a cowboy and his uh, uh water um buffalo, and in this film, um. The the cowboy dream in the cowboy dream he actually lost his buffalo near the waterfall and then he play his、uh, flute and、uh, the beautiful music bring the、um, buffalo back to him. So、um, in the second、um, ink was animation there was no dialogues in in the film so it's a very it's much more、um, accessible to a Western audience compared with the first one where's Mama and.、So I- No, I was going to say. So I have a couple of questions, just because I think this is a good moment to quickly put. So、um, the director is at the beginning, essentially the beginning and end of 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 the Chinese、um, formulation studio, because he also、um, directed the Conceited General, obviously. But I just wondered、um, when you say ink wash animation, which is something we haven't encountered on the on the pot. We've talked about cell animation and stop motion and claymation and computer animation.、Um, ink, what is ink wash animation? It's it's presumably different to To, to to sell animation, though pr- probably they're the closest、um, in terms of you know aesthetics, but but it's something very specific to the Chinese context. Yes, actually,、um, ink、uh, ink wash animation is actually is a technique,、uh, right? Paint painterly techniques from ink wash painting. So that is a traditional Chinese painting.、Um, <clears throat> traditional Chinese painting can be divided into two types. One type、um, is called gongbi painting.、Um, it focuses on the decorative effects through very fine and、uh, and dedicated lines, very vivid colors and the details.、Um, many Chinese animation borrow this style,、uh, especially applying its background. If you are familiar with uh, uh, the one、uh, have. In heaven, so the landscape in that film is a typical, a very typical, a typical um gombi painting, and another style、right. is called ink wash painting. So、right. it is featured by the、uh, let's say very simple and stylized image,、um, very casual、um, brushwork, and a very limited use of color. So um. By applying this kind of techniques of traditional ink wash painting into animation making, it makes the film、uh, full of you know the oriental charm and make it quite fresh、uh, for、yeah. Western or, or the,、uh, animations. No, I think that's that's it's really interesting that that kind of recent turns within computer animation have moved towards what we might loosely call in a I mean it's slightly different to to this but but a sort of painterly painterly effect and and people have written on the painterly effects of computer animation and the and the nostalgia for hand drawn or the the way in which the computer is made to look like hand drawn animation and and um and、uh, Helen Haswell has written on on sort of that affinity with with within computer animation towards exactly what you're describing as. Sort of painterly, painterly style that really comes to the fore in feelings from from mountain and water. It seems like it's it's kind of the pinnacle of that ink wash style that that really ornate, as you say, that that sort of ornately Chinese aesthetic, that watercolor almost aesthetic.、Um, that well, why don't you? Yeah, why don't you tell us about about the film because this is, as I said, I think the aesthetic style of it is absolutely incredible and and. Um, reminded me of、um, Kagua, you know the the re- more recent film with the, with the use of of kind of、um, yeah pa- a painterly style. But what is feelings from mountain and water beyond the fact that it's a beautiful painterly film?、Um, that that is this. Am I right? Thinking the last ink wash animation. Um, so that、um, that was made in 1988,、uh, about 19 minutes long.、Um, it's it's always the third and last ink wash animation. So the, the story actually based on a traditional Chinese、uh, legend.、Um, during the spring and autumn period, which was around 2000 years ago, so there is a guy called、um, Boya. Oh yeah,、uh, he is a famous musician. He traveled amongst the mountains and the water to play his jin,、uh, which is an ancient Chinese stringed、uh, instrument. So in the mountains, he met a fisherman and called、uh, Zhang Ziqi,、uh, who could completely understand what he was thinking about just by listening to his music. So、uh, Ya told Ziqi how to play Jin, and they become very close friends till、um, Bo Ya died. So the original story is about、um, amongst the mountains and the water, we chance up on a very close friend, 
Um, in this animation, Toei um, adapted to a story about the relationship between an old musician and a young boy. So the young mm -hmm. boy runs a boat and the old musician falls ear when he is traveling uh, by the boat with a boy. Then the boy kindly uh, takes him to his house and they take care of him. So during the during his stay, the old musician teaches the boy how to play the gym and they um, perform together amongst the mountains and the water before the old musician leaves. So Toby actually mentioned that through this very um, poetical animation, he tried to depict the beauty of the nature and the beauty of the humanity. So that's a, about the story. Mm. I, I don't I, I'm going to keep my thoughts on this quite brief because I don't really have anything to add other than what we've already said I've got I've got that I think it's the most beautiful film of the five and that includes the music actually I don't know if we know anything about the music but I thought the music was really wonderful and I thought the the but yeah I thought it was, thought it was a beautiful movie I thought it was w incredible designed and I'm sad to hear that this this is a production style that isn't used anymore is that is that is that the expense of it or just the logistics of it what's the reason for behind that very expensive to produce yeah. it, um, a lot of work. Uh, so that film, 50, 90 minutes, uh, they spent like two and a half year to finish right. it. Wow, okay, they, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, A lot of work there. Um, yeah, it's, it's, that's the reason I pick up this one because that's my favorite one, it's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I probably talk a little bit from the, the one point I want to make is um, poetical animation. So, um, you know, compared with the narrative animated film that uh, usually are based on very strong cause and effects connections, the story of, usually the story of ink, uh, watch animation, are often very uh, simple and loose, you can find from this one. And the film are usually built around this symbolical uh, imagery, you know, so images. So just like um, um, poetry or um, prose, so, uh, for example, I don't know if can, you can remember at the end of this film, uh, when the old musician uh, leaves a boy, there are a series of shots moving progressively um, to the dark claws and yes. to a slowly eager flying the sky and to um, a swirling waterfall and to the fast running water and then to a light foggy mist on the river. And, uh, you know, they use those symbolist um, images to express the feeling of separation. And yeah. it actually reminded me about um, Ozu, if you you know the Japanese director Ozu, mm. is a pillow yeah. source? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so actually you use a lot of, uh, in this film, they use a lot of wide shots and long shots to show the landscape, actually with no obvious narrative reasons. So um, it's to me, it's quite similar to old oh, this, this um, pillow shots or empty shots, uh, which is a kind of a cut away from the previous things to a short or a multiple shots of objects or landscape just to deliver a very deep feeling or emotion um, mm. without any, you know, with not very obvious narrative purpose. So um, I would see this kind of pillow shots actually used more widely and more often in ink watch animation not only limited to the transition but also uh, i would say more importantly to control the piece and to deliver the very subtle and deep emotion um so quite mm. a payout mm. yeah no i i I, w I suppose i wanted to to a couple of things. I, I, yeah, I really like the watercolor aesthetic. But one thing I wanted to, to mention is this: this uh, is it Shan Shui style, this sort of uh, traditional Chinese painting aesthetic. Because I noticed that a lot of the scenes took place outside, um, and there's no dialogue, which you get natural sounds that are in service of creating this um, natural environment. On top of that, seven string Chinese musical instrument that you mentioned. Um, my only two other points one is i really liked i think there was a storm sequence where it looked like watercolor was being flicked onto or dropped onto the page which i really really liked i thought that was a that was both a traditional way of or, or maintained the traditional aesthetic of this this sort of ink wash style but almost became a reflexive it's raining and so it's raining watercolor and that was a moment where i thought oh that's a really interesting way of using 
the medium or the affordances of the medium to, to, to feed back into the narrative. So I really, really liked that. Uh, and also, and it goes back to what you said about the ending. Mike, I had a question about whether the academic, whether the, the um, I kind of read him as this old sage academic, but whether he departed or whether he died, there was something really sort of melancholy about that at, at the end. But it was, it was what you said around in place of character movement, you have a sort of fade out, or a, or, a, or a dissolve that creates the illusion of movement. And I noticed that in a couple of the examples, that rather than having a kind of animated on, on ones or twos where every single pose is, is mapped out and then it's played through like a flick book, i.e. animation, there was a, a, a really interesting way of articulating movement that fades, fades one movement in for another and you don't have the complete movement, you have a series of keyframes but without the in-betweening you have a series of bang 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 um shots with the fade doing the job of in-betweening which i thought was was really in incredible um we will move on that was our most beautiful film this is probably the next one is probably my favorite uh, not for any particularly intellectual reason other than i giggled throughout a lot of it and just thought it was a really uh, well told well crafted uh, story so this is three monks so we're going back in time actually a little bit to 1981 still in a similar era but i'm assuming we're now going to talk about for the next two a different artist so if to Wei is the sort of um father of of chinese or shanghai animation studios for want of a better term um we have a different artist now to, to think through for the next two uh, or the next couple of examples um so so Wang Wang, why don't you tell us about three monks and and, and the story of this film i probably introduce um the director first because yeah, he's the director of the next three animations so ada he was born in 1930 34 and um, uh, also called shi jida um, he is one of the second generation animators working for uh, shanghai animation film studios and um, he was held quite high regard by um, many of his colleagues but he died at only 53 years old so he didn't really become particularly famous either at home or abroad. Um, but um, Three Monks was, uh, was made in 1980, directed by Ada. Um, this work has received the most international awards in Chinese animation history, and it usually thought to be Ada's highest uh, achievement. Um, the story um, of Three Monks comes from an old Chinese proverb. Um, basically, is one monk has water to drink, two monks will probably have water to drink, three monks will have no water to drink. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very simple story. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I really liked it. I think that beyond the, the, the humor, I think um, I really like the stark and kind of suggestive backgrounds, um, the children's illustration styles, so a series of cuts into the home right at the start that seem to be just magnifying the image rather than rather than anything else, kind of zoom in. And I know anime, when it, with regards to movement, has a has a similar sort of approach to, to, to movement, passing backgrounds behind characters and moving it manually to create the illusion of flight. There was something around the, the sort of use of the zoom into the house at the start. Um, I loved, my favourite bit is non-verbal, the faint footprints in the ground that show the re um, kind of repetitive activity, which of course, you know, a lot of animation shorter than this, you know, the seven minute cartoon of, of the Hollywood Golden Age is founded on acts that are repetitive, Roadrunner, Tom and Jerry, everything like that. So I really liked that nuancing of, of repetitive acts. But I also thought the sound, you know, no dialogue, but I, I suppose a sort of Mickey Mousing of sound, where the sound perfectly fits the animated animated action and and the way in which the camera tilts in the camera give the illusion of the monks monks walking uphill. Um, and I thought it was really strange and striking that every time a, the monk appears, they appear as if they're a drawing. So they don't appear as a character who walks into shot. They appear in a really fragmented head or top of the head, head, body, torso, and then the rest of the, the, the legs. So I really liked that reflexive treatment of of their size and, and, and colour. Yeah, it's, it's a good one. Exactly. I think you made a, a lot of very good points. In terms of music, um, as you said, actually, this this film abandoned dialogue. And yeah. not only the folk music to speak for the characters and also um, to drive the plot forward. Um, so actually, Ada choose the series of um, traditional Chinese music um, um, instruments to deliver 
um, the personalities of three monks and highlights the different environments. For example, um, you know, um, uh, uh, you probably uh, noticed that there, there was a, a, a very light and a cheerful um, 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 melody played mm -hmm. by the uh, folk music instrument, which is called the ban banhu, that for the little monkey, uh, little monk, indicating his very happy and bubbly personality. Right, and right. Then it was the same uh, melody was later played by another folk instrument, uh, uh, Hu, uh, which was made to um, produce a little bit low and deep songs that for the taller. A monk just to present his um, inflexible, in, inflexible and stiff personality. And when the fat monk appears on the screen and the same um, uh, melody was repeated again, but played by the Chinese instrument uh, Guan, which was um, a little bit rough and heavy sound representing the fat monk, uh, monks, you know, this kind of racked and the massive futures. So they, they actually use the same music, just played by different music instrument to uh, present the different personalities of the characters. And I was struck because I've written down that this was a much more kind of made in a much more limited style than, than the other films we've been talking about. But I was struck where the film chose to, to add detail and to add kind of nuances and, and, and a you know labor intensive animation style and, and it's in the it's in the clothes again it's in the the water that they carry it's in the the bending of the stick as they try to heave this sort of water up and down the hill and having various uh, arguments about whose job it is to fetch it and how um, and yeah, it seemed to me in many ways very different from, say, the first movie, The Conceited General, but in many ways had some similarities in that the emphasis, once again, seemed to be through characterization, through movement, through through the details of movement and how bodies move against fabric and all these kind of intricacies, which, you know, I think when we say limited animation, it's very easy for listeners or indeed for us to kind of slip into, OK, so everything's sort of not got much attention to detail. It's all very scattered. It's all very kind of haphazard almost but doesn't seem haphazard this it's it's just which things are chosen to be given detail and which are chosen to be accentuated and yeah i did i did i did notice that there's a lot of detail given over to kind of communicating weight and and mass and bodies and movement and labor um in a story where that's kind of really important both to the humor but also the kind of parable being told Yes, yes, exactly, totally. Uh, probably one. I don't know if you noticed that. Uh, actually, um, there's a, it's an adaptation of the original uh, Chinese proverb. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know if you noticed that there, there actually there is a quite a strong educational purpose there. Um, there it's um, uh, that's something. Um, uh, um, so did you notice there is um, a, there is a Buddha statue there? Mm -hmm. yeah so actually that one is quite interesting to have that because there was no that one in the original story so um i think um as a, you know because chinese animation have a long history of being to educate the children so um it's a quite common way um chinese animation used to educate the children uh, by creating some characters to judge both right and wrong behavior mm. Okay. So in this film, you can see there is a, it's very interesting to see there is a kind of Buddha um, statue as a created actually to uh, judge the right and the wrong in, uh, in the room through its facial expressions. And uh, uh, do you remember that uh, uh, the Buddha smells when the little man carries water from the mountain food and puts some uh, into the bottle? Uh, to save the plant and his smells yeah. and later he closed his eyes when the three monks refused to carry water and then his face become uh, kind of shocked and very upset when three monks fight over the water uh, left in the bottle and i remember there's four there's an end at the end the monk the monks um work together to fetch the water then uh, the buddha gives a smell so it's really kind of typical educational approach to animation to chinese animation yeah i i thought that i wasn't sure whether it was the version i was watching or whether the the, the, the statue was kind of smirking and, and had that animated expression but that's really interesting that it's it's used as a cipher or used as a character to, to as you say pass pass judgment um 
but I, I yeah, I mean, I really liked the the, the way it looked as well, and and actually. The, the the last three, so I guess we'll go to the, the come to the last two, ha- felt very very similar in the way that they looked, and presumably that's sort of deliberate. So the the, the final two that you've chosen that you wanted to talk about together um, seem to be visually at least similar to to, to, to this one. Um, so w- which two are we looking at, Alex? So we're looking at uh, Super Soap uh, and the New Doorbell, both from 1986. The shortest of the of the animations we've watched thus far. They're both about sort of five, six minutes each. Um, yeah, I mean, Wan Wan, you tell us all about these two, but um, I would agree, I think, stylistically and, and sort of uh, thematically very similar. I've got written Sesame Street meets Georges Méliès meets Monty Python, uh, question mark. Uh, it was the how I read this, but, but you tell us what these two films are and why you've picked these right. two for us to finish with. Uh, yeah, because um, the both of them are made in 19, uh, 1986. Um, they are the last two films made by Ada before he died. Uh, and right. you can find that the three animations, um, the Pinterest tale are quite similar. Um, so um, probably need to give a little bit, uh, but you might find a difference between the three monks and these two films. Uh, probably have to give a little bit of context in terms of the period in China, because that was 1980s. 1980s was a kind of complicated period in China uh, after reform and the opening up policy in the early 1980s. Um, the Western modernist art actually came to China. So. Um, because um, as we said, between 1950s and the 1980s, the country was quite as loaded. So it allowed the Chinese animation to develop a distinctive Chinese style, um, free from outside influence. But the circumstance kind of changed in the 1980s. So then when the uh, Western modernist art became very popular in China, um, so um, at that stage, like uh, paintings from Van Gogh, Picasso, Kandinsky, and other modernists um, were introduced to China and influence actually influenced a lot of Chinese literature, art, and the painting as well as uh, animation. So that is where uh, soup soup and uh, noodle bear come from. Um, so uh, the soup mm. soup just generate uh, introduce uh, the story so um soup soup and the noodle bell actually are two animations both reflect um the modern people and the modern society in mm. china uh, it's quite different from the early chinese animation uh, based on um, uh, traditional literature um so uh, soup soup reflects actually a social phenomenon through a very simple story there was a man sells uh, soup soup which has the ability to make everything white and the mm-hmm. people rush to uh, buy it after using this special soup, everyone become white, uh, losing all the individualities. And at the at this point, there was a little girl draw people attention because she wears a pink skirt and a purple ball, which makes her um, stand out and look very different um, in this kind of all white world. So the people follow this girl and they soon run into the same businessman who is now selling a soup color. So which color, which looks like um, colored soup and was has the ability to make everything colored. So everyone stop buying, uh, stops to buy this soup color. I loved it. I love I love this one. Um, and yeah, I think the the what, what I really liked about it, again, no dialogue, very much of that sort of modernist style as we've talked about. I liked the fact that that it it kind of deanimated the characters, both in the way that they looked. This super soap removes color from them, but it also seems to impact their energy. So the characters that appear in scenes um, seem to be sort of head down walking. They're this kind of white group, this white mass that follows. You say this young girl who appears to be in color, and I thought it was who ended up being the daughter of the of the of the seller. And I really liked that kind of allegory of or not even allegory this Mm. this satire of supply and demand and essentially how to create your own opposition so how to create a a system whereby you can benefit from both sides of the the uh cleanliness and the dirtying of color so i thought it was it was yeah absolutely absolutely fabulous alex fantasy on this one what are your thoughts or what are your notes on on super soap well, well, with both of them, this and the new doorbell, I've kind of there's this sort of um, technological fantastic going on with both of them, isn't it? In that both the characters are amazed by technology, and technology is amazing. Uh, it, it, uh, and and I think well, I would probably be able to speak better to this to exactly what the the satire is biting at here. But 
yeah, it was noted both in the Super Soap, this kind of idea of making everyone the same colour uh, and this obsession with kind of, yeah, whiteness and, and colour and, and the, 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 you know, the individuality of all the subjects are kind of drained out of them in a kind of humorous, mirthful way, but still making the point very nicely. And then with the new doorbell, you have this story of this sort of gentleman who's who's desperate for everyone to, well one he's desperate to install but then desperate for everyone to, to play and try out his new doorbell and then when like he does he just sort of realizes that he's just sort of alone in an apartment and the doorbell isn't really going to help and actually what the doorbell does is highlight his kind of isolation from everyone rather than it being this like wonderful kind of gimmick that he that he has so yeah both ones kind of make a very social um point very clearly through this kind of um, instrumental marvellous going on which um, yeah very not very nicely observed with both of them yeah I'm, I mean uh, that's a new doorbell because um, at that stage in the 1980s um, in China the doorbell is kind of something very uh, new and pricey so that's why the, right. the, the guy are desperate uh, for visitors and for other pe- uh, people's attention you know, so whenever the footstep approach outside the door, he get excited and expect the people come to uh, ring his doorbell. I thought that, but the style of it though, that it's not just a story of of a man who's purchased this this latest gimmick and wants to wants everybody to use it and gets really frustrated when when people come by but don't go anywhere near his house or his flat or knock at the door when they should be using the doorbell. Uh, I was struck by the fact it was it was. Formally, it was kind of a side-on view. Uh, you're looking at a cross section of a of a Wendy house or a, um, a, a a kind of I don't know. It was very theatrical, I think, in the way that it and it recalled the the kinds of movement from left to right that that was that marked, I guess, early cartoons. You know, Felix the Cat, and, and again, those sorts of chase narratives that I talked about the seven minute cartoon of action from left to right or right to left, but but certainly on on uh, what's the word a kind of plain plain view so yeah so a really great cross-section i think of cartoons yeah and, and i'm aware of, i'm pushed for t- we're pushed for time so we we just sort of we better wrap up there i guess with our with our very brief snapshot introduction to the shanghai film studio and its place within uh, animation history i think there's loads more for us to do on this and and huan huan thank you so much for providing us that list and talking us through these these wonderful introductions to chinese animation um we're really privileged thank you so much for coming on the podcast Thank you so much for having me. So you can find us, of course, on fantasy-animation.org, where you can access our archive of blogs and podcasts. Um, if you enjoyed this episode, you might enjoy the Sub-Saharan African introduction with Paula Callas, um, another completely different narrative um, and animation context to be introduced to, and we do a similar top five there. Um if you are a, a scholar out there or a PhD student or a master's student interested in this form of, um, or, or in, in anything related to Chinese animation, we'd love to hear from you to write a blog post. You can um, get in touch via the website at the Contact Us tab, or you can email us at fananimresearch um, at gmail.com. That's F-A-N-A-N-I-M research. Um, you can also use that uh, handle to find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. But I guess that's been us for another episode, um, and I guess we'll see you next time. Bye.